Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our webinar today. My name is David Godwin, and I am the director of the Southern Fire Exchange Program with the University of Florida. From our Southern Fire Exchange team, I'm joined today by Mary Nell Armstrong with Tall Timbers Research Station. We're really excited to have you on our webinar today, and I'm glad you're here. Today, we have a presentation by Dr. Roger Barker and Dr. Joe Roycey from North Carolina State University. Dr. Roycey and Dr. Barker will be giving a presentation on their work developing new prototype wildland fire shelters for firefighters. So now it is my pleasure to introduce our speakers today. Dr. Roger Barker is the Burlington Distinguished Professor in the Wilson College of Textiles at NC State University. He's the founding, founding director of NC State's Textile Protection and Comfort Center, TPAC, a world-leading center for research and testing of protective gear for firefighters. He holds BS and MS degrees in physics from the University of Tennessee and a PhD in textile and polymer science from Clemson University. He received the Alexander Quarles Holiday Medal of Excellence, the highest award given to a faculty member by NC State University, and the Bruce Teal Award for his work in service to firefighters. His primary research is focused on delivering and developing advanced test methods and evaluating the protective and functional performance of firefighter protective gear and hazardous fire exposure. He's a member of ASTM F23 and NFPA committees. They're developing test methods and performance standards for protective gear used by firefighters. Welcome, Dr. Barker. Our next speaker is Dr. Joe Roycey. Dr. Roycey is a professor of forestry in North Carolina State University. He's been involved in the integration of forest management, resource valuation, harvesting, logistics, wildlife, and wildland fire for much of his career. He is the NC State PI and a senior member of the management team for the Southern Fire Exchange. I have the pleasure of working with Joe regularly. He is the author of over 100 publications and peer-reviewed journals, plus many conference proceedings, book chapters, and major technical reports. He's a member of the Society of American Foresters and the Institute for Operations Research and Management Sciences. He's taught undergraduate and graduate courses in fire science, forest operations, forest management, geographic information systems, mathematics, and computer science. Before becoming a scientist, Dr. Joe Roycey's early forestry career included time working on the Green Mountain National Forest in Vermont, two years on the uh, Route National Forest in Colorado, and two years in the Olympic Peninsula in Washington State as an assistant forest manager. So welcome, Roger and Joe. We're glad to have you with us here today. And just one moment, everyone, as we trade out presentations and they are able to get started. If we're ready to go, uh, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you, David, for that uh, for that nice introduction. And uh, uh, it's an honor to be part of this webinar uh, today. Uh, so uh, Joe and I are going to tell you about a, a collaboration that we had. It was a good collaboration between our TPAC Center at. Uh, uh, at the College of Textiles uh, that we we're very proud of because we do so much work in test methods and materials development that relates to firefighter PPE and the College of Natural Resources uh, at NC State uh, Forestry through through Joe. So the work that we'll be, be telling you about is a result of a three-year project that we collaborated on that was sponsored by the DHS FEMA assistance to firefighter uh, grants program. And so uh, it involved a, a, not a great many people uh, and uh, we appreciate all, all that, that uh, they did. So we're gonna tell you about the outcomes of some of the research and what we learned about in the process of developing advanced fire blocking materials uh, to be used in the construction of fire shelters as well as uh, uh, what we learned by testing them both in the laboratory and, and in the field. So I know that, that uh, I'm speaking to a lot of uh, wildland firefighters, so you know 
very well uh, about fire shelters. And uh, I hear that, that they are the uh, last line of defense. And uh, the things to know that I've heard is that they need to be deployable very quickly, maybe less than 40 seconds. And uh, so you don't have a lot, you have a lot of requirements around the functionality of, of the fire shelter itself. And once deployed, uh, you would uh, then be on the ground, a cleared area and lay in a prone position. So you all know more about that than I do. So our goal was to see what we could do to, uh, to advance the, the thermal performance of these, of these fire shelters. Next slide, Joe. So uh, I'll start here and describe the uh, fire shelter construction. Uh, sh fire shelters have evolved over a period of years. And uh, prior to about 2000, the generation, uh, one fire shelter consisted of a pup tent type, single layer aluminized glass, fiberglass shelter. Through some excellent work that was done by many people, including the US Forest Service, uh, they produced a uh, generation two shelter that will be the uh, shelter that we'll talk a lot about today. And that actually uh, consisted of a more domed or cylindrical shape. That's an excellent shape from a geometrical point of view for reflecting uh, radiant heat. And so the expectation is that a uh, wildland shelter might, may be deployed in, in, uh, in, as, that, as that last line of defense, but it would be expected to provide you with, with protection against radiant thermal energy, as well as uh, convective uh, energy when the flames are in, in direct contact with the shelter. Next slide, Joe. So the uh, so-called M2002 fire shelter uh, has done a lot of things well. It's, uh, it has many uh, very good attributes. It's a simple in, in design, relatively speaking. It's relatively inexpensive. And it provides excellent protection against radiant heat, standoff heat, heat that comes from you at a distance, so to speak, primarily. But uh, the, uh, uh, the, the weakness in, in, in the uh, shelter had to do with uh, the poor, poor flame, uh, flame protection it provided, the protection it provided after the flames were in direct contact with it. Next slide, Joe. So uh, just, to, just to, to review what the M2002 shelter construction was, it, was, it, it is, it's made of uh, a composite of uh, uh, layers, an outer shell that consists of a aluminized foil that's bonded to a uh, uh, silica fabric by a water acrylic adhesive, and an inner shell that consists of a fiberglass layer bonded to uh, aluminum foil. So our research was uh, focused around how could we uh, look at designs of these multi-layer fabric systems and improve the construction from the standpoint of its performance. Next slide. So to do that, uh, we, we had to do at least four things uh, well. We had to understand uh, what, how it performed and, and what was causing the, uh, the instances where it, where it uh, transmitted heat. And then we had to take that, that knowledge of, of, the, uh, of what was happening with the current shelter and use it to guide the development of enhanced flame blocking materials. We also wanted to look at primarily because we saw this as a weakness and in, 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 uh, uh, possible weakness was how could we look for more robust uh, seam constructions for the shelter itself. And then uh, the hallmark of our study was testing the shelter uh, from, from every level, which meant testing the materials themselves that went into the construction at a fabric or bench level 
but also developing unique full-scale tests in the laboratory to evaluate them and then ultimately uh, evaluating and comparing the performance and learning uh, uh, about the performance in field tests and prescribed burns. And Joe is going to tell you a lot about that in just a, uh, just a little while. Next slide. So uh, some of the things that, uh, that appeared to be the, the most important was that obviously the fires need fire shelters need to block radiant and convective heat. Uh, certainly they must do a good job in effectively reflecting incident radiant heat. Uh, but we uh, came to come to think that uh, the most severe thermal stress comes when you have direct contact with the turbulent flames produced by wind driven uh, fires. And that turbulent flame uh, contact was causing a lot of damage to that aluminized layer. Next slide. Next slide, Joe. So uh, what we did was begin our study and research by trying to understand how, how these materials uh, respond to intense uh, flames and radiant energy uh, of intensities that would be a reasonable approximation of a, of a fire condition. And we used a tester called a Thermal Protective Performance Tester or TPP tester, which is a bench scale way to produce that level of heat and to expose samples of the fire shelter construction material to that heat in a very controlled way so that we could observe how it would uh, break down in flames as time passes and also measure the amount of heat that was transmitted on the backside uh, through to the inside of what would be the, the shelter. Next slide, Joe. This, these, this is a photograph, several photographs of what we observed. Uh, we observed that, that the fire and flame produced a degradation effect in the uh, aluminized layer and in, in the composite structure that resulted in delamination and off-gassing of, of the adhesive that bonded the, the materials together in, in, the, in the laminate that eventually when the temperature reached a certain level, that aluminum would melt. And then ultimately the uh, adhesive gases that come comes from the adhesive would themselves ignite. So that's the process we were able to qualify by just studying the, the, the samples of the materials themselves. Next slide, Joe. I'm trying to um, progress the slides, but it's not showing up on the screen. There we go. That's, that's the next one. There you go. No, this is the next one. Th that's the next one. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Joe. Okay. I'm sorry about that. All right. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So this is a, a, a diagram that, that uh, sort of summarizes what we found. We found that when in direct contact with flames, the major uh, mechanism for transferring heat through the fire uh, shelter itself was actually through convection. At a certain point, part of the, of the transmitted heat came from radiant energy. But surely after the, after the uh, outer aluminized shell was degraded and melted, then that uh, produced a, a, a release of convective thermal energy that would penetrate on into the inner layers of, of the uh, outer shell and inner shell construction. Next slide, Joe. See how this goes.
Okay, coming up a little slow, but I see the next one. Thank you, Joe. Uh, they're just a delay for some reason. Um, yeah, gotcha. I can't get rid of it. So we apologize for this, uh, everybody, but we'll they'll come up eventually. So this this slide represents uh, uh, a summary of what what we learned that we needed to do in terms of providing the highest level of thermal protected performance. We needed to have layers there that would reflect that radiant energy, uh, which is the heat that comes as the fire approaches the shelter, as the flame front approaches the fire shelter that's been deployed. But we needed to have convective blocker, blocking layers to prevent those hot gases from penetrating into the interior space that's created by the, by the uh, uh, shelter, the breathing space for, for the firefighter that would be inside that shelter. Since that's the convective form of energy that, that we were looking at in that burnover situation. And then as you always do in, in, in insulation, you need to have an addition, uh, maximize the, minimize the conduction of the heat through the layers themselves. So you have to have uh, air trapping materials that are non-woven textile materials to add uh, a, a higher level of insulation. And then you needed to have an innermost layer that again on the backside, the interior side, block the flames and heat gases and prevent uh, the heating up of the interior of the, of the airspace and prevent um, uh, burn injury to prevent that smoke and hot gas from entering into that for that breathing space inside the shelter. Next slide, Joe. So uh, long story short is over the course of the project, we looked at uh, many, many uh, different advanced materials uh, for every layer of the uh, fire shelter construction, looked at different materials. We looked at different weights. We took, looked at various layering strategy. Did it make a difference where you place different types of, of insulating and convective blocking layers, radiant heat blocking layers in that construction? And uh, having done that, what was, what was the feasibility of constructing this uh, this uh, this composite in, in in actuality. Next slide. So as a result of a long research process, we were able to. The good news is that, as shown in this slide, this slide shows various prototype options that we developed in comparison to the M two thousand and two, which is the, the control shelter in this case. And it shows a graph below that that shows the measured uh, rise in heat flux through those different systems as a function of time. And the blue line, the upper blue line or purple line on this is the control M2002 shelter. And the lower three graphs that show you that as time progressed from zero up to 60 seconds, the rate of, of heat penetration through the prototypes that had been developed through that optimization process that I just described were effective in reducing the rate of heat transmission uh, in comparison to the M2002 control. So uh, through that down selection process, we uh, then uh, endeavored to, to make full-scale shelter prototypes that could be evaluated. Uh, and we used the existing M2002 shelter design, but incorporated into it the newer heat blocking composites that we had, uh, we had uh, discovered. And then we also uh, built in what we consider to be more insulating and robust seam constructions into uh, the prototypes. Next slide. All right. So to test the uh, full-scale prototype in the lab, we uh, developed a, a apparatus that we call Pyrodome. And the purpose of the Pyrodome was to 
give us a good ability to simulate uh, the burnover condition that would occur in uh, a wildfire situation inside the lab. And uh, this uh, slide shows various photographs. And in the lower left hand side of the, the uh, um, photograph slide, you can see the, a prototype shelter or a shelter. And above it, you can see uh, those are gas burners, propane gas burners. And so the idea was to, to instrument that uh, shelter so we were able to measure temperatures inside the, the chamber and other things. Uh, and then to increase the realism of the exposure, we uh, then surrounded uh, that shelter with a stainless steel dome, hence the name Power Dome. So this produced a tremendous amount of heat. And what we were interested in measuring inside the, the chamber was the temperature at uh, where we had thermocouples placed two inches from the uh, ground level of the, of the test chamber and also at 10 inches. We also had a GoPro camera inside and outside the shelter so we could observe what was happening as the heat exposure was, was going on. So uh, if I could go to the next slide, Joe. The thing that we wanted to do was to, as far as we can, no, no laboratory test is ever going to simulate every possible field exposure. I think you all appreciate that. But we wanted to have a, a pro, uh, an exposure in the power dome that was a, a reasonable test of the, of the thermal protective performance. So, our heat exposure was up to 65 seconds of direct contact with turbulent flames in a heat intensity level somewhere between 70 and 90 kilowatts per square meter. The thing that we also wanted to do was to observe what was going on in this lab test to see if it produced the same level of thermal degradation as we observed in. Uh, uh, wildland shelters that had been uh, in, a, in a prescribed burn, in the burnover situation. Next slide, Joe. And it did, as that photo, those photographs illustrate. As I mentioned to you, uh, the per key performance uh, uh, measures were the interior temperature measured at two inches from the floor. That would be closest to the breathing space of the firefighter that would be deployed inside the shelter. We also wanted to, uh, to uh, observe how long it would take before we saw the inner, uh, from the inside view of the shelter, when that layer of heat had caused uh, the deg degradation or even burning inside the chamber, the shelter material itself. The graph here shows you the kind of data that we produced showing the, the uh, temperature rise um, as a function of time over about a minute. The 150 degree C line represents the uh, expected uh, temperature of, of human survivability. Beyond that, the, hair, the, the air becomes too, too hot to breathe uh, without, without uh, injury. Next slide. So this is a really great uh, video here because it shows you the inside view. And as you see the heat progress, you can see the, the walls of the chamber contracting. Eventually you start to see uh, emission from, from the interior layer of the chamber. And then, and this is a really cool shot here that shows that now you've had full break open and eventually delamination. So obviously you could not survive a situation like that. So we took the, the time it took uh, to reach this condition where there was complete destruction of the shelter material as an important measure. And usually that occurred somewhat before the air temperature at two inches above the floor of the shelter reached a non-survivable level. So we had those two metrics to to utilize in, in, our, in our lab studies. 
Next slide, Joe. So this is a, a, a data output from the pyrodome test. It contains a lot of information. This is a graph that on the vertical axis shows the temperature at two inches above the ground level as a function of time up to 60 seconds. And it shows the rate of rise for the M2002 control shelter versus four of the options that we had. And these options had different weights. Uh, options one and, and four were, were heavier weights. Option nine and 10 were somewhat uh, lighter weight constructions. But the takeaway that, that we got from this is that in the full-scale uh, test that we were able to conduct on full-scale prototype shelters, we were demonstrating a, a ther an expected thermal performance that exceeded the M2002 control. Next slide. So that leads me actually to, to introduce or let Joe take over at this point from uh, a series of down selections that uh, we won't get into the details. We identified the number of prototypes that we wanted to put into the field to see how that data related to what we'd already learned through extensive laboratory testing, including in Pyrodome. So I'll turn it over to you, Joe. Thank you very much, Roger. Um, hopefully I have myself demuted. <clears throat> so what you're looking at here is the picture of North America and we're, we're located in North Carolina, but we wanted to get fuel types and fire conditions from all across North America, just to see, just to get the variations that we um, expect to happen in, in fire. So tests one and three are down in Southern California, one through three, I'm sorry. So tests one, two, and three are Southern California. Then we went up to uh, uh, South Dakota, test uh, four and five, that was in the, uh, one was in tall grass prairie and one was in a, a short grass pra prairie. So that, that was interesting. We went back to North Carolina and we did uh, test number six, which was in a long leaf uh, wire graphs um, ecosystem. Then we went up to uh, the Northwest Territory at the uh, Crown Fire Experimental Unit. Um, <clears throat> and we did test seven and the conditions just got too moist there. We couldn't burn it anymore. So we came back down to North Carolina again, we did test number eight. So we really had fuel conditions all across um, North America. So these are the shelters that we were looking at. Um, let's see if I can work this. There it goes. So this is M2002, which is the existing shelter. And then we had options one and four, which were the primary options we had. And then later on, we went to options nine and 10. So that you can see the difference in construction of these. Uh, we already went over uh, M2002, which has the uh, outer layer of aluminum and the inner layer of aluminum. Um, so for all the other options, we had the same exterior layer. So the outer layer was always the same. Then we started adding inner layers. And so option one had um, a, a layers of flame resistant fiberglass batting and aluminum coated polyamide film acting as a convective barrier. And option four was similar, but it had more, um, <clears throat> it had more layers. It was heavier. They were both actually on both of the option one and option four were at 5.3 pounds. The M2002 is at 4.3 pounds, which was um, not a constraint, but it was, they suggested or we suggested that we should try some uh, lower weight shelt shelters. So we got down for options nine and 10, down to 4.1 pounds. And, and for 10, it was uh, 9.3. 4.3 pounds. Those are pretty much identical to what we have for M2003. So we have nine and 10 are pretty much 
um, lighter versions of options one and four. So we had fuel types that we were interested in getting. And so in California, it was the chaparral. The chaparral was actually cut down the year before and piled, and it was not bone dry, but it was very dry. Uh, the grasslands in uh, Madison, South Dakota, um, they were cured and they, uh, the tall grass was cured and it was burnt very hot. And the short grass uh, was still had some green and it didn't burn as hot. Um, the longleaf pine upland and upland hardwoods in Eastern North Carolina, um, they kind of speak for themselves. The upland hardwood was uh, from a, uh, a harvest that took place again a year before and they piled a huge um, stack of wood all around the, the test areas, um, which you, you should wonder why uh, this one turned out the way it did because it was so, so much energy. And then we had the boreal forest, which was a, a jack pine and a black spruce up in uh, the Northwest Territories of Canada. So these are just uh, repeating the locations here. So we have test one through eight, um, the fuel types for each one of them, um, the ambient air temperature and relative humidity or in this column, wind speed, which turns out to be very significant uh, factor in, uh, in, in shelter testing. Um, and then we have the um, radiant energy. So the 94 here is, that's the uh, kilowatts per meter squared total. And the 62 is radiant uh, kilowatts per meter squared. So just to look at that ratio or the difference between those is, is interesting. But this is very much, this 94 is very much like what we were doing in the pyrodome. Uh, this 80 is very much like in the pyrodome. And we got this one, 137 was over what we were using, it, uh, experiencing the pyrodome, but the uh, radiant was, was lower, that's interesting enough. Uh, Madison, Wisconsin, it was 147. This was in tall grass prairie. The short grass was, uh, was less. Um, Carver's Creek, North Carolina, this, this was in a longleaf pine wiregrass community. So it had 97 that was the total, which again is pretty much in the ballpark of what we we're doing in the pyrodome. Northwest Territory, uh, we had 209. So this was our highest uh, heat flux and the highest radiant energy flux. Um, we'll go through the results of these, but it's surprising that the, to me at least, that more damage wasn't done in this one uh, simply because of the amount of heat there. And then down in Asheboro with the um, hardwood, um, stack of hardwood um, slash, which probably was a good 15 feet tall ar around the, shelters and they weren't far away from the shelters. Um, it's about a foot away from the shelters. It didn't it didn't do much because of the uh, structure of the flames. It sucked all the uh, heat up into the air, which was interesting. Okay, this is a layout of a test layout of the uh, uh, shelters. So we did a random order in here, but just for since we're going to look at test number one uh, several times here. This one is M2002 on the uh, right-hand side. This was option one, and we have little labels on it because we were taking pictures just to record them in every one of them. But you can see the M2002, this is option one, this is option four. This right here is a anemometer. Um, these are thermal coupled towers, so there's four uh, thermal couples in each one of the towers. Um, there are uh, heat flux meters right out in here, right in front of it. There, within the shelters, there was also the same configuration as we had in the laboratory. We had the, the short thermal couple tree with um, thermal couples two inches off the ground to represent the breathing space. And, and then we had uh, at 10 inches off the, off the ground. Um, we also had the heat flux sensors inside of this, and we also had a, 
um, GoPro cameras to do it. So this is what this is what um, test number one looked like before we started. There's also a, a GoPro camera right up behind these rocks that you can't see, and there's also another thermal couple tower over to the um, off the screen. It didn't get in the picture. They, these are all three three feet up from your your shelter. So this is a um, a picture of test number one, and you can see this is uh, M two thousand two, and it's getting hit by flames right now. This is M two thousand. This is um, option one, and then this is option four in this flame here. And this you saw pictures of option option four after this um, earlier in this presentation. So it was totally. Um, the exterior was totally gone of the of the shelter. You can see right here. There's a the anemometer is really flying around, so the the wind speed really got up pretty high. Um, we are on the top of Mount Palomar, about two not the top, but about 100 um, 150 feet below the top, and we are on the east side of it. And the winds are coming from the west, and so the 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 fire managers thought that the wind was going to come around the mountain and hit us from both sides so they were interested in seeing what was going to happen it seems like it came mostly from the uh, from the north side of the mountain so the the wind was coming from the north we were predicting something different when we set up the uh, the test site okay that's always kind of interesting now this is, we had to let it cool off some, but we walked in, uh, walked into the site after the fire was gone. And this is what it looked like. So this is option four. Uh, I think it's not 100%, it's 99% um, delaminated. So there's no, very little aluminum left on the outside. This is option one, which is kind of a mystery to me because it, it has the same exterior and it appeared to be within the flames, but it was zero, it was a little bit scorched, but it was 0% delaminated. And then M2002 over on this side, we saw it getting hit by flames and it did get about 28% delaminated. So th this is um, what we get from the, um, from the tests. Most of them look something like this after we're done. Just a bunch of ash in the, in the different shelters. This is M2002, and again, it's it's showing the the delamination. This is about 28% of the surface area was delaminated in M2002, and actually had a breakthrough right in here. Now this is option four. So we looked at the the outside of option four was um, totally delaminated, and I thought the whole thing was destroyed destroyed until we turned it over and we looked inside. There was no um, delamination or no damage at all showing on the inside. And this was the uh, polyamide films that we were talking about earlier. So this was the internal uh, conduction blocking uh, layer, which actually did a pretty good job. So the results that we were looking for was we wanted to get the maximum exterior temperature. So, so we made a, um, a summation of all the temperatures over 660 degrees. We also were looking at other temperatures, but the 660 degrees was a good, the time above 660 degrees, the melting point of aluminum, really um, correlated nicely with the, uh, the damage being done to the sh shelters. And then we wanted the maximum interior temperature. So at two inches, we wanted to make sure, just like in the pyrodome, uh, we wanted to track the, the temperature uh, at two inches off the ground uh, for test purposes. Now this, this is just a, a summary of the times, <clears throat> excuse, excuse me, over 660 uh, um, degrees. And also we have in here 260 degrees, but I'm gonna ignore the 260 because it didn't really uh, correlate much in there. But once it got, up into above 660 degrees C, um, 
we started to see some uh, comparable results. So this is 15 seconds for M2002. Uh, option four, which was the one we that was totally delaminated at 63 seconds. And option one, which was 51 seconds. And then going across here, you can see the different, these are the different times. And sometimes we didn't get up, we didn't record temperatures above um, uh, 660 degrees, like, like in these right here for test five and six. <clears throat> okay. This is a, um, a temperature profile of option um, four in test one. So this is a temperature profile that we recorded using the thermal couple trees. We were using the ones two inch or four, two, excuse me, uh, two feet off the ground, which um, again, correlated, seemed to be the most relevant once we were looking at the data. So this is two feet off the ground. This, uh, the red colored one, I think it's red, at least to me, that was for thermal couple tree four. And this, the orangish yellow color was from thermal couple tree one. And we summed the times above this line right here, which is the uh, 660 degree line. So this line re represents the melting point of aluminum. And this kind of blue line or purple line, can't tell the color again, but I'm pointing at it. Oops, I, I have this little thing. So that is the uh, survivability line. And then this bottom solid curve, this is the um, uh, temperature two inches off the ground of uh, inside the shelter. And we started at the ambient temperature here and it decreased very slowly. And then once it, once things started to delaminate, you were getting more uh, heat getting into it, but it never, it never got up to the um, survivability line. So it, it got pretty high in the inside of it, but it, a person would have survived this. So the upper line is the melting point of aluminum, summing the times of both the thermal couple tree one and thermal couple tree four above that line gives us something we called the sum of temperatures at 660 degrees. And then the lower solid curve is the uh, shelter temperature inside the shelter at two inches from the ground. And the difference between the peak and ambient temperature is something we called change in temperature. So that represents how much energy got into the shelter from, uh, from the fire. So that was the difference between what we started at here and then the peak that we ended up with here. So we use this ratio, um, which we called R660, is the ratio of the internal temperature change to the exterior temperature. So that's, I think I have the equation right here. That's simply the change in temperature inside to the exterior, the sum of the exterior temperatures above 660. Um, so it's a me measure of the performance of the shelter. And the lower that number is, the, the better it is. And the higher that number is, uh, the worse it is as far as, um, as, for, as, far as insulating the uh, interior of the shelter. So this is, you could just think change of interior temperature as a function of the, um, the total temperature outside or the sum of the temperatures outside the shelter. So this, th this table gives a summary of all the tests and it has, again, I put in the, uh, the peak um, total flux in here just for references so you can look back up for them back up for it, for it. And these are the uh, peak internal temperatures of each one of the, uh, the shelters. So this one, test one, even though it broke through on M2002, it was still survivable. It was at 110 degrees. Um, I put in the in external damages here. So this was 28% delaminated and 
then test four is the only other one that was delaminated for M2002. They all have the same external um, layer. So these damages are really a function of the flames hitting the, um, the shelter. So this one, um, option four, it had a temperature of 124. So it was hot, but it was survivable. And so on option one, which did, had no degradation, it didn't get very, well, it was hot again, 78 degrees is hot, uh, but it's, um, again, it's survivable. So each one of these things represents the survivability as long as it's less than uh, 150 degrees. And again, this is showing that we looked at this picture before. Um, we had the, this is option one that was, I'm sorry, this is option four that was um, uh, totally delaminated. We turned it over and we took the pictures uh, and the interior was undamaged. So it didn't get through. You can see the flames were scorching around the edge. So they were coming up trying to get inside, but they never got in, into the inter interior of the shelter. So these curves, or not curves, but uh, bar charts is for option, each of the options that we were testing. So option four, option one, and M2002. And then the colors here are for, this was test one, test three, and then the lab tests. Since we, after doing eight tests in the field, only, um, only two of them were really comparable or to uh, what happened in the lab. So, the, so we only could use those two and we were hoping to get some kind of st statistical stuff out of this, but because of the, um, the variability of the, of, the, of the flames, we only got two that actually uh, made comparable results to what was happening in the pyrodome. Um, but, but also notice that the pyrodome is kind of uh, predictive of what we found in the field under these cases. So for option four, um, which was behaved the best and was uh, it was the heaviest, I believe, 5.3 pounds. Um, it was very similar. Option one, it had that one that shelter that we. I'm kind of amazed that it only it had such. It was very low as far as the flame contact. Attack. That's the only uh, conclusion I can I can reach on this, but. For option, um, for test number three, it was much higher and for, than for test number one. And then if we go to M2002, this is test number one, this is test number three, the middle one, and then the lab tests, that's test, uh, those are the, the pyrodome results. The pyrodome results, <clears throat> excuse me, it's interesting because those are all, they repeated it three times. So th these are the average of the three. And it seems that the tests on the field, they behave very much like they did in the pyrodome, except for this one right here. <laughs> it's almost a straight line between these, except for the um, test number one on option one. It just didn't get any damage at all. So what we learned from the field tests, um, well, the first thing we learned was variable, variable conditions made it very difficult to obtain consistent heat flux exposures in the field. In other words, we, there, we couldn't actually have some kind of statistical comparison. We can just see the, the results from those two. The field tests often did not produce heat exposure levels sufficiently intense to enable a meaningful comparison of the fire shelters. And that's really because of the, I, I attribute a lot of that to the wind and the structure of the fuels. And it, it, did it suck all the uh, heat up into the air or did it actually uh, blow it down like you saw in, in the video a couple slides ago. 
there's a confirmed turbulent nature of the wind driven flames in the burnovers. So this is true and that the ones that had the worst damage were the ones that had the uh, the highest winds or the winds were laying, were laying the flames down close to the ground. So that's an interesting thing. And this, well, if I go back to test number four in, in, in South Dakota, we had to eliminate that one. That would have been a, a really hot, uh, good comparison, but because because we didn't dig up all the roots underneath the, the shelters, the, the ground started burning and it went into the roots and it went up into the interior of the shelter. And we decided that we couldn't use that as a, a verifiable uh, test. Too bad, it was too bad we didn't dig, a, dig the holes deeper to put the shelters in, but that would have been unrealistic also. Uh, we confirmed the importance of direct flame contact producing degradation and delamination of the aluminized outer shell, shell. And that that's, seems to be true. In field conditions tested, all shelters provided adequate protection. So uh, none of them went above 150 degrees uh, centigrade. And Roger, do you want to talk about the lab um, results? You're muted. I'd be glad to, Joe. Uh, so uh, one of the things that, that you, you try to uh, establish is what, what kind of heat conditions you need to test under. And as you saw from the field results, the actual wildfires can range over a great uh, range uh, in terms of how intense they are. But we found, uh, as Joe pointed out, that uh, uh, we uh, we set that uh, intensity at about 84 kilowatt or watts kilowatts per square meter, which is equivalent to uh, the what we actually saw in the chaparral burns, and uh, we said they kind of validated the the design of the chamber that focused on producing the turbulent flames that would maximize the degradation of that outer aluminized layer. Uh, we saw that in general, in, in, at least in, in the pyrodome test, uh, the, uh, and when I talk about outperform, we're really talking about a focus on the thermal protective performance and, and not any other qualities. But generally, it, it outperformed because we had added the convective blockers and uh, in, a way, in a way, in some of the prototypes had somewhat higher uh, uh, weight, our, our prototypes, weigh between four and five pounds. The, the M2002 weighs about four pounds. And although, uh, as Joe has, has told you, the, the variability of the thermal exposure and wind conditions made it hard to get any hard statistics from, for comparisons, uh, the trends that we saw in the pyrodome was generally uh, validated or predicted uh, uh, observed in, in, in the field studies as well. So that was a good thing. Yeah, so actually the, the hottest fire had no damage at all. It, that was the one up in the Northwest Territories. And it was the, <clears throat> the, the kilowatts per uh, meter squared were uh, just way above any of the other tests. But what happened is it sucked all the heat up and it didn't damage the shelters at all. So it's hard to predict what's going to happen. So with that, I think we are open for questions if we have any. I think, uh, Joe, the, the, uh, this slide here gives uh, some of the limitations that we, we feel that we need to, to uh, at least point out. and. Uh, it's obvious that uh, the, our results are specific to the conditions that we tested in, and none That's of right. our none of our exposures produced the very hottest uh, burnover conditions that can be observed. That can overwhelm any any fire shelter that's 
that can be de uh, portable and can be deployed. And uh, as I've said earlier, our study focused on thermal insulative performance. And you have to take into consideration a lot of different properties when you consider uh, uh, the viability of different shelters and, and the uh, US Forest Service outlined guide, guidelines for testing as uh, does the NFPA 1977 uh, standard on, on uh, protective clothing for protective gear for uh, wildland firefighters. Uh, so we, we, we present this as, as a discovery of knowledge that we hope will, will, will help guide the development of, of better shelters that offer protection and functionality but we're not in our in our data here recommending or excluding any 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 particular product or construction that you may consider. This is specific to what we're showing here, and it's not easy to generalize in some cases. All right. Well, Dr. Barker and Dr. Royce, thank you so much for your presentation. I know we're up at the top of the hour, but we've had some really good questions come in. And uh, if, if y'all are able to, I'd like to try and see if we can uh, get to some of these questions because folks have um, put some interesting things in here for discussion. So I'm going to go back through some of these. Early on, uh, you all talked about uh, the off-gassing of some of those adhesives uh, that occurred um, early in the testing environments. Um, Tim asked a question, you know, is, is that the, the gases that are coming off of those adhesives as, as uh, delamination occurs, are, are those toxic? And do we know if that would result in a lethal condition within um, the uh, shelter prior to a lethal temperature occurring? Well, I would say uh, that uh, the, uh... One of the reasons that we added the uh, observation of the, of the time it took before we observed that uh, delamination and offcasting in the interior of the chamber was that occurred in most cases uh, before we we saw a temperature build up uh, at the uh, ground level that would would exceed the survivable level. Uh, so our assumption was that. Uh, failure occurred, uh, that would be a failure point. When we, when we saw that all that uh, uh, breakdown and, and off-gassing and, and even flaming of the interior wall, we thought well, that, that it, uh, would be a, a lethal situation for many reasons. And like I say, that occurred uh, typically the interior air, air temperature for good reason is used as a, as a benchmark of of uh, rating the, the thermal protective performance of shelter, but we thought it was important to add this just because it it uh, is uh, certainly you saw the, the video that that we presented of what that looks like. So by the time that occurs, uh, we doubted the, the ability of, uh, to survive inside that uh, fire chamber, fire shelter. Relating to that. Another question, um, you mentioned that you looked at the temperature two inches above the floor or at the bottom of the shelter inside. Do you have any data collected at, at a vertical profile beyond two inches inside the shelter of, of temperatures? Well, we, we measured at two inches because that, uh, Although we did, we did also measure at 10 inches as well, but we focused on that two inches as um, in, in this presentation because that's the uh, location if, if the firefighter is deployed prone, uh, where the breathing air would, would, would be available. And that's why the, the focus on that. So we didn't really uh, uh, analyze in depth the distribution of air temperatures with inside a particular fire shelter as much as we wanted to find out when that two inch temperature uh, got to be uh, approaching or exceeding the survival for breathing air. Mm -hmm. 
I had a question from Courtney, uh, and Courtney asked, you know, how long would someone be able to stay inside a shelter just based on the air supply um, within that shelter? That's a good question. What we've seen is that the fire will try to go underneath the shelter and burn into the shelter. And, um, but if you've sealed everything properly, you know, using your body, legs and arms to keep air from coming in, I'm not sure how long you could survive. I mean, just because of the air supply. Mm -hmm. It's not a perfect seal uh, in any case, but there's also, you don't, you don't want the flames to come in Flames will find a hole if there is a hole into the shelter. There's an interesting question that came in, came from Paul. You mentioned, Joe, that your tests in grassland were not successful because the fire uh, was able to essentially creep up underneath your test shelters. And Paul is wondering, do you think that fire shelters should be considered in grassland environments um, given the uh, results of your test. And, and he also suggests, you know, given the, the lack of uh, potential deployment sites. Well, um, our Canadian friends don't use shelters because of, I think, because of the, the possibility of of a, a grass fire is going underneath in the, at least in the Canadian plains. But the, that's a good question. Because the soil is so deep where we were at that to get down to the ground to uh, the mineral layer, we'd have to dig down probably a good six inches. And we didn't have time for that. We had a we were just trying to scrape everything off that we had. And I think we had like a five minute um, time limit for, for preparing the shelters piece on the ground. So we did a four by eight piece that we put the shelters into and really up in the tall grass prairies, it's the soil's deeper. And, and then we had time to scrape away. So that's a good point. I can't answer that whether you you shouldn't or should use it but if you had if you can get down to mineral soil you're good if you're still on um the o horizon it can it can burn underneath we were wading down the edges in all of them um, but in in the dakotas it was <clears throat> it was hot and it was uh deep soil so we could didn't have anything to you know, we were trying to do the test. That, that's it. So I can't answer that question. Roger, do you have anything to say about that? I think you did it, did uh, cover it well, Joe. Okay. This is an interesting question that came in uh, from Brian. And Brian was asking if uh, you looked at the two different size shelters that are available now. So the, the M2000 shelter comes in sort of a standard size and a um, a large size shelter. Um, did you look at the large option? No, we did not. Simply because we we're just trying to figure out whether these shelters are better or not, or mm -hmm. not better, but whether they work or not. Um, so um, another question that came in uh, to the Q and A and Zooms. So when do you expect? So just you know, from where y'all sit, when do you expect that we'll see a next generation, a new generation of fire shelter um, deployed, at least here, I hate to say deployed, um, as an option here uh, in the U.S.? Well, that's a, that's a really great question. And we know there's a lot of innovation going on out there. And uh, certainly the U.S. Forest Service uh, encourages that sort of thing. And the fact that we've got 
more knowledge. We think the ours is truly a research study, and the purpose of it was to produce a better understanding. It did show that uh, that uh, there were designs of material designs that could produce somewhat better uh, fire protection in, in burnovers within roughly the same weight range as, as the current technology. But there's a lot of things that still need to be considered. And it was, uh, uh, we were very happy that we were, could produce a study that would shed some fundamental insights on that. And also to, to show how important it is to have uh, laboratory test methods that really give you an ability to uh, see how the shelters are gonna perform even at the full scale before they are tested in the field. Because uh, as we've demonstrated, field studies can, can really produce very variable results and they take a lot of time and, and they're very costly. So we, we like to think that, that one of the uh, outcomes of, of uh, our research was to advance that state of the art. And uh, so we believe that, that one of the answers here is to have well-defined performance standards for fire shelters so that manufacturers will know what to test and what level of, of uh, performance needs to be achieved in a range of properties, not just fire protection. Uh, uh, so they'll know, they'll have some real clear cut targets to shoot for. So in that sense, I think this research study contributes to that knowledge base that, that has furthered that, that, uh, uh, that goal. Well, thank you. Joe, did you have any other uh, closing comments that you'd like to share? Well, it did be very similar to what Roger was just saying, is that um, we were, we're researchers trying to figure out what types of materials and stuff go together and how to uh, block, how to block uh, heat from getting into a shelter. And, um, and we would hope to, to continue this type of research. Um, I'm sure we can always do better. That's our, that's my thought is we can always do a, we can always make a better mousetrap or a better shelter uh, to protect the firefighters. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Well, thank you so much, both of you. I have enjoyed your presentation today. We've had a great turnout and I know everybody else enjoyed it. It's been really interesting work um, for everybody who carries a fire shelter on their back or, or knows somebody uh, who does. Uh, we appreciate the value of the work, the effort that y'all have put into this, and, and good luck in the future as you continue those endeavors. Thank you very much, David. Thank it you. was nice being here. Enjoy it.